Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. It's your host, Michael Shermer. Today's episode is brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium is the online subscription platform for all matters, intellectual, thoughtful, thought-provoking content that you can consume while you're driving, cycling, hiking, doing chores, walking around, doing anything. I've taken personally over the last 30 years dozens and dozens of their full courses and you can too you can subscribe online at wondrium.com slash Shermer and get two years for the price of one that's the offer here today two years of subscription service to Wondrium for the price of one year if you go through wondrium.com slash Shermer w-o-n-d-r-i-u-m dot com slash s-h-e-r-m-e-r just to give you an example I always like to provide an example when I talk about Wondrium uh, this course just popped up in my feed after I listened to some other courses related to the subject. Shocking psychological studies and the lessons they teach. Some of the obvious ones have got to be Milgram's shock experiment. When's the title? Uh, Zimbardo's uh, faux prison experiment at Stanford and many other things. This one is only six lectures, so you can just blast through this. I'd probably do this in a day. Lessons from Tuskegee and Facebook. Uh, I'm not sure what the Facebook reference is, but of course, Tuskegee is the famous um, and tragic experiment conducted by the federal government health agencies to not provide treatment for African Americans uh, with syphilis just to see the course of the disease uh, when they could have. Without the consent or knowledge of the subjects, this led to a lot of reform in the 1970s of how scientific research is done. Pushing good people to do bad things. That's got to be the Milgram shock experiment. Um, three, experimenting on uh, uh, vulnerable children. Not sure what that lecture is going to be about. Looking forward to that. Testing psychochemical weapons. Oh, that has to be the CIA's Project MK Ultra. Dosing U.S. citizens with LSD uh, to see what the effects would be on mind control. Setting up uh, brothels in hotel rooms to lure men in. And then while they're having sex with these prostitutes, dose them with LSD and other psychoactive drugs. It's stunning that our own government was doing this. Anyway, so if you, um, this is just one example of many uh, courses you can take, long, short, uh, various uh, uh, forms of content uh, that you can access through this subscription service. Again, go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash S-A-G-R-M-E-R. You get two years for the price of one. What are you waiting for? Check it out. This is well worth it. All right. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Martin Rees, Astronomer Royale, former president of the Royal Society Fellow and former Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and Emeritus Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics at the University of Cambridge. He sits as a member of the UK House of Lords, and he is the author of many best-selling popular science books, including On the Future, just six numbers before the beginning and our final hour. So I guess you could say he covers the entire, from the beginning of the Big Bang and before to the end of the world. <laughs> His new book is, and here it is, If Science is to Save Us, which just came out. And uh, he deals with, well, the biggest issues of our time that uh, science can address. Martin, I think I'll start with a great quote you have from your the book here. Here's again the cover. You quote... Um, Hannah Arendt in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, in other words, reality of experience, and the distinction between true and false, in other words, the standards of thought, no longer exist. That certainly seems to uh, well describe the current era that we're in. <laughs> That's right, and certain French philosophers as well. <laughs> yes, who write in uh, what Richard Dawkins calls, uh, what is it, European obscurantism. <laughs> right, so um, let's start with the title of your book. Uh, what is science going to save us from? What are you worried about? Well, I think we have uh, a lot to worry about in the next decades. Um, uh, op one Thing is that we've got a growing population, more demanding of energy resources, and uh, climate change, as we know, is very high on the agenda. Um, and uh, this is something which uh, we need to raise public awareness of. Um, so that's one of my concerns. But I also uh, am concerned about the misuse 
of ever more powerful technology. This has been a theme of um, a couple of my earlier books, that um, uh, new technologies, um, especially bio and cyber, empower individuals and small groups to an extent that they can create a massive catastrophe. And this, I think, uh, uh, is a big problem of governance and also a big social problem because uh, we're used to the idea of having a few dissidents and crazy guys, etc. Um, but when they have such a global range, then we can't be so tolerant of them. And I think that if we consider through things we want to preserve, freedom, privacy, and security, we can't really have all three anymore. And I think uh, we've got to probably abandon privacy and accept greater surveillance of everyone because one person plotting an engineered virus that he wants to release is too many. And also we need to worry about uh, uh, massive cyber attacks and things like that. So I think the fact that we have these very powerful technologies um, which are accessible to many people uh, is going to make the world a more dangerous place. And I'm very pessimistic about how we can cope with this. Mm. So the concern is that in previous generations, it would take a state actor the size of a, of a nation state to bring about the end, like nuclear war, something like that. But now you're worried that terrorist organizations, uh, organizations that, that, that don't stamp the, um, the, the envelope with the bomb uh, with the return address of their, of their country, <laughs> it could well, just right. be a rogue it, anybody. Yes. Um, yes. That's and the problem. Course, yes, and we know that yeah. uh, um, you can't make a nuclear weapon without special purpose conspicuous facilities so um, the International Atomic Energy Agency could do a pretty good job at uh, monitoring anything in that uh, arena. Um, but of course, um, when it comes to uh, bio and cyber, uh, then the equipment is readily available to everyone um, and uh, it's harder to monitor without surveillance. And that, that's what worries me. Um, and uh, the way I put it is that um, uh, um, the global village has its village idiots and they will have a global range. In an old-fashioned village, you can tolerate the idiot, but uh, we can't when they have such <laughs> enormous range. So that's my uh, biggest worry. <laughs> yeah. um, and, of course, uh, uh, um, this is against a backdrop where we do have to worry about um, uh, uh, severe climate change, perhaps irreversible and associated mass extinctions and all those things. Um, and um, the big problem is to make the... Um, public and politicians um, aware of these with sufficient urgency. Of course, uh, COVID-19 was a wake-up call, uh, which told us that there could be events that would have a global range um, and be uh, catastrophic over the whole world. Um, but um, when we have a very slowly emergent um, catastrophe like climate change, it's like the, um, the, the frog in the warming tank of water not taking action until it's too late. And we're really in that situation. And uh, the problem is that politicians, um, of course, respond to what voters care about. And unless voters uh, prioritize these long-term um, issues, like making the world safe for their grandchildren, and climate change, then politicians won't prioritize it. And so what we've got to do is to ensure that the public is fully aware that climate change uh, is a threat to their children and grandchildren. And if the public is well aware of that, then politicians won't lose votes if they take actions to uh, guard against catastrophic climate change. And the problem, therefore, is to make the average voters care, because the average voter may have short-term problems. Um, and uh, what I say in my book, is that we should be grateful for um, uh, individuals with great charisma who can influence large numbers of people. Of course, in his lifetime, some of them we both knew was Carl Sagan, um, who, if he was alive today, uh, would be uh, inspiring huge crowds with his uh, inspirational uh, eloquence. And um, we don't have him now. But I quote in my book four uh, very disparate people who are collectively having quite a big influence. Um, first is Pope Paul, Pope uh, Francis, uh, who uh, 
has had a big effect on the climate debate. He produced an encyclical and uh, got a standing ovation at the UN and helped to get consensus at the Paris Climate Conference in 2015. So Pope Francis is my first one. My second is David Attenborough, who has uh, influenced millions through his uh, uh, movies about uh, climate change and ocean pollution, issues like that. The third is Bill Gates, who has a big following and uh, talks a great deal of sense about realistic technologies. And the fourth is Greta Thornburg, who gets through especially to younger people. And of course, uh, we should welcome the fact that young people who hope to be alive at the end of the century are those who clamour loudest for action to prevent dangerous climate change. So those four people uh, have, I think, had a collective influence and even changed the rhetoric of business. We need more like that. Indeed. Well, I, Martin, I would put you in there. I mean, you're one of the inspirational scientists. You're the Carl Sagan of of the 21st century, or at least you're one of them. Um, but but what you're talking about here is inspiring people to want to care about the future when, in fact, they're not incentivized to do so. Yes. Um, you know, given the current, say, economic uh, crisis with uh, inflation and and so forth, why why would I care? You know, a century from now or whatever. And when I see Greta, you know, ranting about you've stolen my childhood and so on, it's like. Pfft, you know, this is not my issue here. I, I got to pay my mortgage next month. Uh, you know, my cost of gas has tripled and, in, in, you know, so on and so forth. That's what I'm worried about. You know, so economists call this a collective action problem. How do you incentivize somebody yeah, to care yeah. now about yeah. something that, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, there are too many people like you, certainly. But I think the main point is that you've got to uh, uh, make people mindful that uh, they're, grandchildren or those who are now small children will be alive at the end of a century. And I think even though um, in economic consideration of discount rates, they may not think that far ahead, I think they do care about the life chances of children born today. Uh, and that should make them care about what the uh, world is like at the end of this century. I think that's the main hope. And if they, if they care, uh, then that will... Um, in, encourage um, politicians to take action uh, and feel that they will not lose votes. That's the only hope, I think. Yeah. But of course, can I say well, your your compatriot Matt Matt. I was going to say you. Uh, we have a little bit of a gap in in the recording here because of the distance. But uh, your compatriot Matt Ridley makes the point that um, to get people to care about the environment, uh, they have to be wealthy enough. Um, so you, it's not really fair for um, first world countries to tell developing countries you can't use fossil fuels uh, when they, you know, they're just making the transition from burning wood and cow pies, you know, and trying to industrialize and get themselves uh, wealthy enough to care about that. And they can't go nuclear or solar or wind because those are expensive to install. So how do you address that issue? Um, well, I mean, you're quite right about that. That uh, I think it's feasible with technology we have now for the um, global north, in particular North America and Europe, to achieve net zero by 2050. But as you say, the problem is that uh, the global south, which is now um, using much less per capita energy by a factor of 10 than we are, and where there will be a billion more people by mid-century than are now, uh, those people, if they develop the way the Chinese have, will be producing um, CO2 via coal-fired power stations, etc., at about 40% of the world's total emissions today. And so the only hope of having global net zero uh, is if technology advances so that there are clean energy um, alternatives which are affordable uh, by those countries and which therefore enable them to leapfrog directly from their presence a situation of burning wood stove, etc., um, to uh, clean energy, just as they have all um, moved directly uh, to uh, smartphones and never had landlines. So it's so I would say that what we have to do is to prioritise um, the um, development of more advanced and cheaper clean energy, so that the developing countries can uh, leapfrog directly to it when they justifiably say they need to have more 
per capita energy in order to develop. So I think that's the only hope. And I think it's not um, too crazy to expect that we could do that with the effort. And it's it's like a sort of mega Marshall plan um, from the, uh, the north to the south. And it clearly, it's in our interest because if we don't um, achieve that goal, then, um, as you say, um, and as Matt Ridley et al. say, uh, then, of course, um, there will be massive um, migration, etc., um, and it'll be bad for the development of countries like Africa um, and, of course, um, lead to a very unstable world. So it's in our interests, not just altruism, for us to ensure that the global south can leapfrog. Yes, the economic energy. interest. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, and, right. Uh, so if you have many countries in Africa that are wealthy that we can trade with, yes, then it's to our benefit. Yeah. Yes. Is there a way well, to get uh, to net uh, zero uh, without uh, nuclear power? Sorry, With nuclear power is a, poss- is a possibility. And uh, is there a way to get? Know, I, I support the um, de- yes. development of fourth generation nuclear to see which one works. So I'm with Bill Gates on that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, because I just don't see it otherwise, uh, how to get there. And I know spent nuclear fuel is a problem, but it seems like that's a problem that science can solve or help solve and continue moving forward without robbing future people of their desire to have uh, energy uh, consumption at the levels we're at now. In other words, how do we go forward? I mean, a lot, a lot of environmentalists, at least it feels like they're they're telling us we need to go backwards, you know, back to a sustainable environment, you know, kind of pre-industrial revolution kind of thing, which, you know, this isn't going to happen. It's not fair. It's not moral to do that, I think. Um, so you have to have technological solutions. Uh, I don't see any other way around it. Yes. But I don't uh, think now, it has to be on new, yeah. over. Po- so let, let me, well, not just nuclear, but in the equation, it's, you know, solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear, you know, have a half a dozen different yes, sources. Yes, but it depends on storage for base load, of course. That's the problem. But of course, uh, mm. um, we could get all the energy from uh, wind and sun uh, if you can store it um, uh, over day to night um, and uh, over summer to winter. But also if we can have a smart grid connecting the whole world so that uh, we can take uh, energy from the sunny south to the uh, less sunny north and east-west to smooth over the peak demand um, in different time zones. So I think um, it's not hopeless mm-hmm. to believe we could get all the energy from sun and wind. Convince me that this is a truly existential threat. In other words, I, I agree You know, climate change is real and, and human-caused and population, nuclear weapons, AI, uh, biodiversity. These are all serious issues that in my mind, they, we, have, we have time to solve them. We're really good at solving problems. That's one of the best things uh, humans do. Um, but when I, you know, I listened to the Greta Thun- Thunberg, since you mentioned her, you know, they, they, that camp makes it sound like we're almost out of time. I mean, doomsday is right around the corner. And I'm old enough, and you're older than me, to remember hearing this way back in the 70s and 80s. You know, we're going to run out of peak oil, you're going to hit peak oil, going to run out of the rainforest overpopulation, Paul Ehrlich, billions of people are going to starve to death. You know, none of this happened. So you can kind of, can you understand why people go, yeah, you know, we've heard this before and it didn't happen. So why should I believe you now? You yes, I don't scientists. understand that, but I think, I think they're wrong because we have climate models. We know what's going to happen. It's not going to kill everyone, but it's going to uh, change the world. Uh, it's certainly going to trigger massive migrations, if, if nothing else. Um, and so it's something which... Uh, surely we should aim to prevent. And as I say, I think it is technically feasible um, with a suitable transfer of resources uh, from north to south um, and a uh, commitment by uh, idealistic young engineers to prioritize the development of clean energy for the world uh, to actually achieve this and avoid what uh, uh, will be um, an irreversible change in in the world's climate. Uh, linked, of course, to um, uh, loss of diversity, mass extinctions, and things of that kind. Uh, so if we want to uh, keep the world not too different the way it is now, uh, then um, it's not too soon to worry about these things. It won't kill us all, and uh, 
but uh, it will change the uh, dem demography of the world. Mm, right. So how much time do you think we have? Uh, I mean, there was a meme going around last year, you know, it's, it's by 2024, it's all over if we don't uh, turn the corner. But you hear other numbers like 2050 or maybe 2100. You know, those climate models, you know, they project out to, say, 2100. And the further out you project, the wider the error bars get. And so you see these numbers, you know, one degree, two degrees, or maybe three or four degrees. Where do, where do you come down on the best estimates for, for how much warmer it could get and what the consequences of that would be? Well, I mean, I take seriously the uh, um, the, the projections of the leading experts. And uh, as you say, there is an uncertainty um, in cloud cover and things like that in particular. Um, but um, uh, if we went on um, as we are now, uh, then... Um, a rise by f five degrees by the end of a century um, is within the range of uh, possibilities. Um, and, um, and that would be a really serious change in global weather patterns. Um, and so, so uh, it's worth a lot to avoid that. It's not going to kill us all. I would emphasize that. Yeah, well, you see the... Right. No, I understand. But it isn't just... Yeah, you're right. It's not It's not right to think of it as just, if it doesn't kill us all, then it's not that bad. If it makes life miserable for billions of people, that's pretty bad. But you'll, you'll see people like uh, Bjorn Lomborg, whom I know you know and are familiar with his work, say, yes, it's all real and human cause is going to happen, but it's not It's not going to be that catastrophic and we have time to do something about it and, and so forth. And, or, you know, I know you have kind of a standing bet with Steve Pinker about, uh, you know, different threats. And to what extent uh, we should be pessimistic or optimistic. And he's on the optimistic side, and I'm pretty much with him on that. You're more on the pessimistic side. Um, you kind of see where the, the levels of uncertainty make it difficult for outsiders who are not scientists, who don't know who to believe, uh, to, to figure out what to do. Yes. But it, since you mentioned Lomborg, I would say that uh, um, my quarrel with him is on the economics. Um, um, I don't think he does uh, disagree mm. with the science. Um, but what he what he does is he applies right. uh, a discount rate to future benefits and disbenefits, um, and therefore um, he doesn't give much weight to what happens after 2050. He discounts that away, um, and he therefore says that it's better to spend money now on immediate uh, um, benefits to the world's poor rather than uh, uh, spending the money to uh, uh, guard against what life would be like for them in the second half of the century. Um, uh, and that's just a consequence of his economic assumptions. And I just uh, don't uh, think everyone shares those assumptions. As I said at the beginning, uh, many people do care about uh, um, the lives of children who are now small and can expect to live to the end of the century, uh, whereas uh, uh, Lomberg neglects that because he does discounts them in a way that may be appropriate in uh, deciding where to put up an apartment block or something but isn't appropriate in this context. So that's my objection to Lomberg. Um, I think he uh, doesn't dissent much with the science. Yeah. Well, so that, but that's maybe a moral or political decision to make, right? Yes. What, in, you know, if, we, if, if we're going to spend a trillion dollars in the next, you know, 50 years or whatever um, to reduce the amount of CO2 gases, to reduce the amount of warming by one degree or half a degree or yes. whatever the calculation is, then the other side says, why don't we spend the trillion dollars on mosquito nets and, and vaccines and, and potable water and just, you know, basic stuff to help people now who are suffering now. You know, this is kind of the long-termism argument versus the short-termism argument. Well, no, I know no, you're, you no, connect with There's no conflict. We, we can perfectly well have the mosquito nets and, and all those things. I mean, the uh, inequalities between the poor countries and the rich countries and the inequality within the rich countries, uh, the fact that the um, richest thousand people in your country um, I bet uh, have the capacity to double the income of the bottom billion, but they're not doing it. This is an ethical indictment. It doesn't mean it's impossible. And and, uh, and better health, uh, uh, focus on tropical diseases and all that um, can be afforded. Um, and, and so it's completely false to place these as antipathetic options. We could do them both. Hmm. We can do both, right. Yes. On overpopulation as a concern, again, you you and I are old enough to remember this, you more than me, when Paul Ehrlich's book came out. And, you know, it looks like the Green Revolution pretty much stemmed most of that projected yes. 
mm-hmm. um, starvation and, and hunger and suffering. Um, and what's the latest projections? We're going to hit like, well, we're about to hit 8 billion, I think next week. Yes. <laughs> and then, yeah, you know, yes. 9, 10 yes. billion around 2050, maybe. Yes. 20, yes. It might be, what are they projecting? 11 billion by 2050. And then by 2100, we'll be back down to where we are now. Well, but yeah, I haven't yeah. looked at those numbers in a while. What, 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 well, what, what, yeah. No, it's, um, um, and um, as you say, about 9 billion by mid-century um, uh, because the birth rate is going down in most countries. Um, it's just it's not going down in, uh, um, in Africa in particular. Um, and what happens after 2050 um, will depend very much on whether um, Africa goes through a demographic transition um, as the rest of the world has. If it does, uh, then uh, the world population may, may start going down. Um, if uh, it remains high in Africa, then Africa's population in some scenarios will double again between 2050 and 2100. Um, and, uh, and if that happens, Nigeria will have the same population as uh, the US and Europe combined. Um, and uh, uh, that's probably not going to be a good situation for, for Africa. Um, but uh, but, but the, I think the main point is that um, the population um, may not increase by a very big factor. Uh, but um, uh, if the standard of living in the poor parts of the world increases, then one probably does have to, um, by most measures, double food production from the present. Um, and, uh, uh, and also, uh, as I said, deal with the fact that as the global south becomes more prosperous, they are going to uh, um, need more energy, and we've got to pro- provide that in a, uh, a carbon-free fashion. Um, so uh, I think the population uh, runaway is unlikely. Uh, population may go down, but um, the population of the global south is, we hope, going to get more demanding if they're going to move to a decent standard of living, and so we do have to cope with that, even if the population doesn't increase. Right. So as I understand it, the richer a country is, the more industrialized, higher the education, particularly giving women empowerment, economic empowerment and control over family size through reproductive rights and so on. Populations just naturally go down and they have what I know there's a couple of dozen industrialized countries now, I think, are below replacement level already. I've seen uh, Elon tweeting about this, you know, that there's going to be a birth dearth in Japan and Sweden and some of these other countries where uh, Russia, you know, they're already falling behind. Yes, I mean, it, it may happen, but um, it, we can't be sure because I know um, uh, my my, uh, my friend Parthasis Gupta, who's one of the world's leading um, development economists, uh, um, he uh, points out that um, uh, most people, when they have the ability to control families, um, they uh, accept the norm in their environment. And uh, he's saying it's not impossible that uh, um, in Africa the norm will remain three or four children. Uh, if, if, if that happened, then that would be bad news for the world. Um, so we must hope that that doesn't happen. That the population um, growth um, is quenched in Africa as it already is in, as you say, most parts of the world. Yeah, I always think environmentalists should take credit for uh, the overpopulation problem. They called our attention to it in the 60s and 70s, and we're doing something about it now, and it's getting better, hopefully. If the trends continue, in much like the people use um, the uh, hole in the, the ozone hole as an example, look, this was a problem. Scientists called our attention to it. We did something about it, and and now the problem solved. Yes, is it that yes. the climate science is a much bigger problem than than just the ozone hole? Oh, certainly it is, because uh, uh, there were good substitutes for the CFCs they were using. Um, it's a bigger problem, but but nonetheless, um, I think it is a a, a soluble. Uh, problem uh, if we prioritize um, technology in in the right way. Um, and that I think it, I think it, it, can, it can be done. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, let's talk about some of the other threats you, you discuss in your book. AI is one of them. Uh, it, just artificial intelligence. And, you know, w- I, we follow this a little bit at Skeptic, you know, the kind of Bostrom uh, model of not that the robots Hate us and want to conquer us or take over. They don't. They don't want anything. They don't. They don't. They don't have emotions or needs or wants. Just that they'll turn us all into paper clips. In his in Bostrom's famous thought experiment, or the equivalent thereof. Do you go that far in worrying about AI? Um, 
Not at all. I mean, I'm more with uh, Rodney Brooks, the inventor of the Baxter robot, who says that for a long time, uh, we need to worry far less about AI than about human stupidity. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm in that line. Right. Um, I think we, we do have to worry about, um, um, in my view, over-dependence on AI, simply because uh, uh, breakdowns could screw things up and, uh, and cause problems. So uh, one worry is a uh, large global networks um, are vulnerable, and so we should worry about them. And, of course, th there are the familiar effects of um, uh, automation of all kinds on the labor force, and uh, um, this can be dealt with by um, changing economics. Um, and to take one particular example, near term, one, um, uh, if um, the uh, rather mind-numbing jobs in Amazon warehouses and uh, uh, telephone call centers can be automated, um, then um, if the people working in them can be um, given uh, more dignified jobs as carers for young and old, gardeners in public parks and things like that, that's win-win. Um, but this requires um, a uh, massive transfer of wealth by taxation from the um, high-tech conglomerates um, uh, to, uh, to fund um, public service jobs. And uh, I don't see much chance of this happening in your country, um, nor in mine with the present government. But I think uh, uh, my line is that in global politics, um, uh, we, we should learn far more from uh, um, European countries like Germany and Holland, and in particular from Scandinavian countries, than we learn from the US. And one of the problems with our government in the Britain is it uh, learns more from the US um, of, uh, allowing huge inequalities, poor public services, etc., and far less uh, from the um, Scandinavian countries. Uh, so um, that's a long uh, digression, but the main point is that uh, um, uh, if AI can uh, displace the most mind-numbing jobs, then provided those people who are doing them can be given jobs which are more fulfilling and where being human is important, like being a carer for young or old, then that's a plus. So, so uh, um, AI can help. And it can it can help, obviously, with uh, managing large networks, electricity grids, and, and traffic. And as I say in my book, it would allow the Chinese to have the kind of planned economy that Marx could only dream of, because they now have information about uh, <laughs> um, their personal expenditure, etc. Right. Uh, um, uh, whether it would be a good thing or not is, uh, in my view, debatable. I don't know what they will do. Well. Uh, and here's the argument for a universal basic income uh, that Andrew Yang makes uh, that you know of that, you know, AI is going to put so many people out of work that, you know, we got to give them some kind of support to make that transition. And then the counter to that is, well, they'll they'll just learn to program. Well, the, the truck drivers will learn some other skill, just like when the horse and buggy went out and automobiles came online, the people that were working in the trade to take care of horses and buggies, they just learn to do something else. Um, yes. where, do you, where do you come down in that debate? Well, I think on, on the latter side, but I think that if we had massive redistribution of wealth, um, then uh, um, what the jobs would be would be uh, uh, jobs caring for young and old. In fact, doing for everyone what rich people do when they've got the money, which is to have real people to look after them. And so uh, if we have massive redistribution, uh, then that that can be done, um, and of course, I think if we ask what jobs are going to be replaced, it's obviously things like work in the warehouse, but it's also uh, things like coding and uh, routine legal work. The kind of jobs that be hardest to replace by machines are gardening and plumbing. You know where where you have to uh, um, have robots that uh, cope with very complicated environments, and so uh, I think. Uh, uh, plumbers will survive for longer than lawyers. <laughs> I think that's right. I forget who uh, whose line this is, uh, it, it, but that you know we have AI that can can beat the greatest chess player of all time, Gary Kasparov. It wins Jeopardy, uh, if, if, you know, a, a technical uh, knowledge based game show here in America. It, it beats Go, the best Go players, but it can't unload a dishwasher. <laughs> Yeah. So going going back to so those to this, kind of I uh, I, uh, yeah. I think you know uh, Bostrom has some r rather crazy ideas. I mean, the most crazy 
um, is um, I heard him give a talk at a Google, uh, um, one of these Google weekend conferences, um, uh, and, and he believes that we should, uh, um, you know, uh, pay, pay, pay regard to the far future and value future lives as much as our own lives. And he said that uh, if we start a program of uh, space expansion, we could, within a few million years, um, uh, spread humans through the galaxy and uh, uh, have 10 to the power 30 happy people in the galaxy. And every year we delay this, denies 10 to the 10 happy people their lives. Uh, now, this is utterly ridiculous and can be answered on its own level by saying, if there's some aliens out there already, then by encroaching on their habitat, we might make a massive negative contribution to uh, gross cosmic contentment. So that, that's a crazy argument. And of course, um, um, the um, effective altruism uh, concern about people in the far future, um, obviously, in principle, they are um, as valuable as our lives are. But on the other hand, um, we can't predict what they will want and what condition they were living in. And therefore, I think we are quite right to uh, focus on the next 50 years and not think too far ahead um, because we just don't know what technology we like and we don't know um, what people's um, preferences will be. Um, I think um, uh, it depends very much on how technology develops. And um, uh, one point about technology is that um, it develops in fixed uh, fits and starts, doesn't it? I mean, only 12 years from Sputnik to the first moon landing, um, but uh, uh, that's still a high point of human space flight more than 50 years later, um, and um, uh, 50 years from uh, the first transatlantic flight to the jumbo jet, and we still have the um, uh, jumbo jet 50 years later, not changed. So the, the things go fast, better. And I think the iPhone 24 may be not too different from the uh, iPhone 14. But of course, the question is, will we have the metaverse or something like that by then? I don't know. But uh, we, we can't, I mean, we can't I mean, how it. many lenses do I need on my camera? Right. I mean, that's right. Yep. it's good enough. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, there was a there was a book. Uh, there's a book recently published. I think it's called After Steve, Steve Jobs. And, yes. mm -hmm. and the author was complaining that uh, Tim, Tim Cook has not been able to replicate the miracle of the iPhone that Jobs did. And so he's not as good as Jobs or Apple's hit its peak or whatever. And then a reviewer in the Wall Street Journal pointed out, how many times can you invent the equivalent of the iPhone? It's like the, you know, the invention of the internet. How come no one's come up with something better than that? Well, how many times can you, you know, it's like, why hasn't somebody done what Newton did and Einstein did? Well, it's yeah. already been done. There's yes, only yes. so many things you can invent like that, and that's yes, it. Yes. That's as good as well, it gets. It something which we can't predict, of course. So, um, we, we we don't know, um, and um, but we shouldn't just expect a straight extrapolation of uh, the present fast-growing technologies. Right. On the AI as a threat, let me give you a specific example here. Uh, here in Santa Barbara, where I'm at, there's a software company called Green Hill, and and the CEO uh, and owner of that, Dan O'Dowd, um, has done some programming for um, uh, Elon Musk's Tesla, uh, and not anymore now. And now he's kind of a campaigner against automation for automobiles, self-driving cars, to the point where he takes out full-page ads in the New York Times and runs uh, commercials against this and tweets constantly about Elon and that his argument is that a terrorist or organization or even a state actor like China could hack the software that controls all these cars. Say like here in California, we have to have all electric cars by, I think it's 2030, no more gas powered cars. Okay, good. Uh, but what's coming is they're all gonna be automated, all self-driving. You know, you can go 90 miles an hour down the 405 freeway with a zillion cars and it just automatically kind of gets you over to the off ramp and you zip off like there was no one there. But they all have to communicate. Anyway, Dan's argument is that somebody could easily hack the software, take over the cars, and just drive them all into a wall. You know, just have this, like, massive terrorist attack where, you know, 100,000 cars just crash within, you know, minutes of each other on the on the 405 freeway or something like that. And, uh, and, and but, and, and, but then, you know, I've, I've run this argument past some, several people, and the counter I hear is, 
well, why isn't this happening already? I mean, why aren't terrorists hacking airliners or hacking the you know airports and causing planes to crash out of the sky? I mean, wouldn't this be happening already if it was possible to do that? Well, of course, there are um, attacks um, on single planes, but I think um, the reason that why one should dismiss this idea is that <clears throat> when everything is so interconnected, then one terrorist or one weirdo uh, can uh, produce some of his cascades very widely, if not globally. So that's why we do need to be ultra cautious, I think, about these elaborate interconnected networks. Um, regarding driverless cars, I mean, I think apart from that uh, nightmare scenario, um, I get the impression that people are uh, less optimistic about how quickly we'll get to so-called stage five um, driverless cars, which mean the car where you can sort of sit in the back um, as though you've got a chauffeur, um, and simply because of uh, the problems of um, uh, children uh, running into the road after a football uh, or um, uh, just general problems. Um, they can work on motorways, but in city traffic, especially in European cities, um, then uh, I think it's going to be very hard to uh, do without the driver. Um, and so I think that's a, a technology which may not be an appropriate one to prioritize. Um, and, uh, and so I think uh, more generally, we do have to ask what are the technologies we should prioritize. I've talked about energy and climate. Um, I think uh, sustainably intensive food production is another one. Uh, so that we can feed um, the world's population um, without uh, despoiling the environment more. Uh, and uh, this is feasible, and artificial meat and all that is, is probably feasible. Um, but um, uh, driverless cars may, uh, may never be realistic in, in the sense of being as good as having a chauffeur. Yeah. Well, I have a, a Tesla, uh, and I, I love Elon Musk as an inspirational figure, but I just don't see it happening anytime, even in remotely. I mean, I would never trust the self-drive, even the assisted driving mode, other than on the freeway. I get in the left lane of the freeway, double-click, takes over the steering wheel, and so on. That's fine. But no way I would use it on uh, surface streets, stop signs. And you can just Google YouTube which Dan O'Dowd Dowd shows in his commercials, you can see these Teslas running over these little dummy kids in, the, in a crosswalk because it doesn't see it or doesn't recognize it as a child with a bike or whatever. These aren't, these aren't literal ones. They're just kind of uh, test dummies that are getting run over. Uh, but you know, we're a long ways from that. So yeah, and, and I and never underestimate the power of the regulatory state to put a stop to it the moment there's a problem, right? Well, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But in fact, um, uh, uh, to plug my other recent book, the one with Don Goldsmith on the uh, uh, future of astronauts, um, it's in space that robots have their greatest scope and cause the fewest problems. And so uh, uh, um, if you think of uh, Musk, of whom well, I greatly admire, I mean, I think many of us think he's a 21st century Brunel, you know, in, in the way he's transformed to traditional industry. Um, and um, uh, uh, and I, I think, you know, if, if I can digress into um, robots in space, um, I think um, uh, the case for sending humans is getting weaker um, because um, uh, uh, robots can do most of the things that humans can do. I mean, uh, on Mars, they can uh, drive a, a, a vehicle over the surface. They can't do geology, but within 20 years, they'll be able to do geology and decide where to dig, etc. And they'll be able to assemble big structures in space or solar energy collectors or um, um, telescopes and things like that, and ditto on the moon. Um, and of course, uh, sending people is vastly more expensive and hazardous, um, especially if we're talking about Mars, where you have to provide provisions for six months and for the return trip. So uh, I think um, if I was an American, I wouldn't spend any, wouldn't want to spend any taxpayers' money on NASA's human spaceflight program. Um, because, and the reason for that is that NASA has to be very risk averse. You saw that from the uh, history of the shuttle when there were two failures in 135 launches and each of those failures, which we can remember and killed seven people and was a national trauma and they tried to bring down the um, uh, risk still further. But that was a less than 2% failure rate. 
and uh, to bring down the chance of um, uh, getting to Mars and back. Two percent would be completely unfeasible, and the, and uh, NASA is just going and spending more and more money without doing it. So, so my line really is that um, uh, we should regard uh, human space flight as simply um, a, a great human invent- adventure for heroic thrill seekers and risk takers, and leave it to Messrs Musk and Bezos and cheer them on, um, because they can, of course, um, they, can, they can take the kind of people prepared to accept. A high risk, and of course, those who go hang gliding in Yosemite and around the world ballooning and all that will do that. And there will be people who will um, be willing to go to Mars on a one way trip. And good luck to them, we can cheer them on. Um, and uh, this should be funded by um, the private billionaires or by sponsorship um, and uh, presented as a dangerous adventure. Um, whereas NASA, I don't think, could ever realistically do something which uh, they openly said was likely to kill the people involved. But you, you wouldn't apply that to the unmanned space flight program where JPL builds these uh, robot spacecraft and sends them all over the solar system. That's different, right? Oh, well, I, 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 I'm a great enthusiast for robotic spa- space flight. I mean, I think uh, um, um, to explore Mars, um, <clears throat> to build structures on the moon um, and in space. And of course, as you say, um, to um, explore the um, outer planets of their moons, to look for life under the ice of uh, Enceladus and Europa, for instance. And of course, um, uh, for um, a flotilla of small robots, it's not much more difficult for them to get out to Jupiter or Saturn um, than to uh, get to Mars. It takes, it takes longer, but uh, you don't have to feed them all on a journey, etc. So it's, it's not it's uh, uh, possible for them to go to the outer solar system whereas no one is seriously talking about humans going to the outer solar system. So I'm extremely in favor of uh, um, robots um, for exploring the solar system and for building structures, big telescopes, um, uh, communication equipment, and all that um, in in space. Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear you say that. Okay, you remember since I brought up Paul Ehrlich, you remember he had that bet with Julian Simon about the price of uh, precious minerals and, and and things like that. And Julian Simon, the economist, won those over Paul Ehrlich, the biologist, um, because things were not as bad as he said. Okay, what's your bet and beef with Steven Pinker? Don't you guys have a bet about uh, certain thing, events that would happen coming in, in the future? Well, we had a bet. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, the bet in my, um, with the Long Now Foundation, which takes these long bets, um, was that... Um, by 2020, um, an episode of bio error or bio terror would kill a million people. And uh, um, uh, Stephen took me up on this and restated 400 pounds, charity, etc. So he took me up on this. Um, and of course, what's actually happened is that uh, we've had um, uh, a pandemic that's killed 10 million or more people. Okay, uh, but of course, uh, my provisor was. It was bio error or bio terror. So um, uh, whether I win or not depends on whether the pandemic was naturally caused or was error leakage from oh, the low hand. Oh, you mean a, the lab um, leak uh, hypothesis? Yeah. So the uh, lab yeah, leak yeah. hypothesis, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and I think, as you know, I think the lab leak hypothesis is uh, um, most people think it's unlikely, but it's not. It's not crazy. There have been leaks from high security labs in the past. Um, and so um, uh, Stephen Pinker and I wrote um, about a year ago uh, a joint article in the New State, which is one of the leading British weeklies, on why we were uh, not yet settling the bet, uh, which was simply that reason that we, um, it was at that stage, unclear uh, whether um, it was a, uh, an error, a, le- a leakage, or whether it was natural. Um, and we said further... Uh, I would, that... I wouldn't... Hmm. So as we said further, that if it was a leakage, um, it's better if we can never prove it. Because um, uh, if uh, it was proved it was a leakage, then the tragedy would have a villain and relations between China and the United States would get even worse than they now are. Uh, So it's far better that we never know the definiteness, even if it was true. And, And the... Uh, so we have but, but the lab leak hypothesis is not 
Yeah. The lab leak hypothesis is not a conspiracy theory that there was a terrorist act on the part of the Chinese government, but that oh, no, it was just an accident. So you can't exactly, really blame. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Precisely. Uh, um, I think. Um, uh, um, and, and that's what what some people take quite seriously a, a leakage from a lab. I mean, for instance, there was a leakage from a um, a lab in Britain that caused uh, one of our main foot and mouth disease um, uh, epidemics among cattle in two thousand and nine. Um, so th these these things can can happen. And incidentally, I think to uh, improve security at the sixty plus level four labs around the world should be a top priority for all the nations involved. Yeah, but again, I, I don't see why it would cause uh, international relations problems if it's an accident. Now, maybe maybe what you mean is that the Chinese government's not particularly transparent about their actions, and they would cover up even an accident, and that could lead to tensions. But, well, but if, if it was an accident, then uh, um, one would say that they uh, had not taken enough precautions and they'd been careless. And so I think that's it would still be deemed reprehensible, especially by the Americans. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about trust in science, as you know, because we're talking about COVID-19. Yes, There's been yes. a pretty massive breakdown in, in the public trust of science and scientists who used to have a pretty high standing in polls about institutions that you trust. You know, Congress and the government is pretty low. Also, politicians, people don't trust them. You know, Fortune 500 company CEOs, people don't trust them, and and for good reason because they, you know, there's enough bad things that happen. At least that gets coverage, that it makes people suspicious, and uh, so you'll hear you, you'll hear this little line of reasoning, um, such as it is. You know, Anthony Fauci told us we don't have to wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. You don't need masks. And then, oh well, he lied because he was covering up to protect the masks for the frontline workers. Then he says you have to wear masks and then the mask will prevent it. No, it won't prevent it. The vaccines will prevent you from getting COVID. No, it won't prevent it. It prepares your body. You know, in other words, people seem to be getting what to them seems like mixed messages. So when when a, a scientist like you says, hey, we, we really got to be concerned about climate change, and then the response is, well, why should I believe you? I mean, you guys can't get your story straight on these other things. Well, I mean, uh, I think you're very unfair to the scientists and you're factually wrong. Because the uh, certainly in our country, the uh, reputation of scientists was enhanced and is very high, certainly higher um, than other prof other professions, uh, politicians, journalists, um, and, and all the rest, and is very high and was I, I think enhanced because um, uh, the um, senior the Fauci equivalents I think did a good job as I think he did too, and I think the public um, understood that when the pandemic started, people didn't know. It wasn't clear how important it was to wear masks, and it wasn't known how quickly we'd have a vaccine, etc. Um, and uh, I think the um, uh, the fact that uh, vaccines were developed within a year, uh, when we don't, after forty years, have one for HIV, was a remarkable achievement. So I contest what you say, as it was bad for science. I mean, I think uh, um, obviously the scientists were very uncertain at the start, um, but they learned, and I think this was a object lesson in how science develops. Um, and uh, uh, and I think the same is true um, in other um, scientific contexts where it has a uh, a big impact on the public. I think the the scientific community, especially the academic part of it, um, is uh, is very high, highly trusted. Certainly more so than other professions. Certainly more so than business executives. So I, I don't should agree have with pointed you. out when yeah. I'm talking about climate. Uh, when I'm talking about the lack of trust in science, I mean mostly the political. Uh, politicization of it, mostly on the right, of those particular issues. Uh, people on the left have other uh, anti-science attitudes about GMOs, for example, or nuclear power. Those are more left-leaning objections to science. So I should have been clear about well, that. You, you, in America, anyway, it's more of the right. Uh, American eccentricities on the world. I mean, uh, uh, and uh, uh, anti-vaxxers <laughs> right. and all that. <laughs> right. More prominent in your country and, yeah. and linked to politics. And, uh, right. uh, you know, you've got to realize right. how America looks from the rest of the world. Um, only in the most recent <laughs> polls do more than 50 percent believe in Darwin. So you're way behind the rest of the world in terms of scientific mm -hmm. education. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Right. All right. So what, what's the solution to this problem? You talk about this in your book. 
science communication, science education. You know, if you were science education czar, what would you do to change the state of science education communication now? Um, well, I mean, I think um, well, there are two things. One is um, um, s uh, general education of the public. Uh, I think we are lucky to have lots of good uh, um, popularizers, etc. But in terms of uh, a formal education, um, there are two things which are bad in my country. One is, and I think it's the same for you, um, the number of um, uh, science graduates, especially in physics, who are teaching in schools is, is very small. And so um, most people, when they're at high school stage, don't get exposed to uh, uh, people who are well qualified in science. Um, and this is so sad because, as we know, uh, young kids are enthusiastic about science, you know, dinosaurs and space to start with, etc. And uh, uh, that enthusiasm ought to be being turned into uh, uh, interest in science generally. But that's not happening because substantially of uninspiring teaching. Um, that's one thing. And in Britain, it's aggravated uh, by the fact that we have a system where you start specialising in the curriculum before you're 16. And one thing which is, uh, well, I've been involved in a campaign to change this in Britain, which is that um, we ought to have a broad curriculum to the age of 18, because what's happening now is that those who are turned off science <clears throat> for their 16 and drop it, are then not qualified for entry to a, a good university to study science. They may regret that they dropped science, but they, they, they can't catch up. So we've got to um, have more flexible education, um, not specializing too early, and of course, uh, allowing people to um, uh, uh, drop out of universities and drop back in, which they can do more easily in the US than in Britain at the moment. Um, but, uh, uh, but I think for formal education, um, those are the things we have to do and to um, raise the number of uh, good teachers um, and also, of course, supplement um, the real teaching by uh, good online material is what we should be doing. And I think uh, I know people in, in the US are doing this and we are doing it certainly in the UK. Um, but I think in terms of school education, um, uh, both the UK and the US are, are way behind the countries of East Asia, you know, Singapore and Korea and places. Yeah, and that's... So you have, I guess that would be your own sort of pipeline problem, uh, which is in America applied to why aren't there more women and people of color in STEM fields? Now, most other fields are fully integrated and there's just as many women, if not more women than men getting degrees and so on. But it seems to be lacking in engineering and physics and math. Why is that, in your opinion? Well, I think the, the main problem is, is, in, is in math because in the biological sciences, um, it's, it's, only, it's not so big. And uh, among those who choose to be vets, most are women in Britain. You know, that's, that's, that's popular. Um, but, uh, but, but there, there, is, a, there is a problem um, uh, that um, too big a fraction of girls uh, drop math and physics um, at the stage when they have to make a choice, which, as I said, is too early in Britain. Um, and I mean, in, in, in terms of... Um, uh, uh, of, the, of the racial thing, um, certainly in Britain, the um, most of the um, immigrant population um, uh, is um, has higher quality of uh, achievement uh, than uh, what you would call poor whites. I mean, the the the, the, uh, the weakest academically contingent are are, are the poor whites, the um, um, the Indians, and uh, uh, the um, the the, um, the African uh, um, immigrants um, are way ahead of the, of the poor whites. So it's uh, it's it's not a simple uh, um, business about uh, um, minority races being handicapped. Mm, interesting. Yes, yes, very good. All right, let's talk a little philosophy of science and how it works. Since you talk about that a little bit in the book, you know what is science? How does it operate? Do you think, you know, there's this debate about to what extent um, Popper's idea of falsification uh, rules in science? Do scientists try to falsify their hypotheses? Or are they really more Bayesian and they're trying to confirm their hypotheses by gathering more evidence that supports it and they're not inclined to try to falsify their hypotheses? Or is it a little bit of both? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. But I think um, 
uh, um, you know, the, the naive interpretation of Popper um, uh, oversimplifies it. Let me give one example, which I think isn't in my book, but uh, I'll give this. Um, uh, you know about the Marcus and Morley experiment that was done in uh, 1890, wasn't it, which, which showed that, uh, that light um, moved at the same speed. Uh, um, supposing that had been done in the 17th century, it would have been used as evidence against Copernicus. Because people would have said, well, mm. this shows the Earth isn't moving. Um, and so it would, it would wrongly have been used to refute Copernicus by, by straightforward logic. Uh, and so that's just an example of how um, a refutation um, uh, isn't something which you do absolutely. It depends on the, the context and the, um, uh, and the mindset and the knowledge you, and perception you have of, of science at that stage. So that, that's a simple example um, where um, uh, a simple application of a, a good experiment um, uh, would um, give a, a wrong conclusion regarding Copernican science. Um, and there are other, other examples like that. So that's just saying that um, uh, simple refu refutation is, um, is, is not quite so clear cut because it, it may depend on other uncertain assumptions. Um, but um, uh, I, think, um, uh, I think we'd all agree that um, uh, um, it is a Bayesian process. And, um, uh, and of course, the, the other point is that um, uh, if we're Bayesians, then um, we accept that something which a priori seems very unlikely requires a, a stronger level of proof. I mean, as Carl Sagan first said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And, uh, and, and, and that's true. You quite rightly uh, seek um, stronger evidence for something which seems um, intrinsically implausible or seems to conflict with a, a well-established body of knowledge. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I think um, that's the way science is done. But uh, one point I make in my book um, is that um, the scientific, scientific method, so-called, um, I think is sort of touted too much as something special. Um, I think the way scientists think um, is no different from the way a detective thinks um, or, a, uh, or a lawyer, uh, in that you try, uh, you, you uh, make hypotheses, you get data and, and alter your hypotheses. Um, I don't think there's anything special about the so-called scientific method. It's just a, a way of assessing um, evidence um, as best you can, and, and uh, in principle, just what a te te detective does. But it's a powerful method. Yeah, interesting. That... Although lawyers, it was a little bit different in the law, I think, because the, 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 the purpose of a lawyer is to defend his client and to try to win at any cost, <laughs> right? Uh, the lawyers don't want to know what's true. I mean, right? I mean, somebody asked, uh, Alan Dershowitz tell, yeah, yeah. Alan Dershowitz tells the story of meeting uh, uh, one of the one of the prime ministers of Israel. I forget who, which one it was, uh, who asked him, you know, do you think OJ did it? <laughs> and he said, let me ask you something. Does Israel have nuclear weapons? And he says, you know, I can't tell you that. And he goes, right. <laughs> and uh, Dershowitz makes the point. He doesn't ask if he doesn't ask if his client did it. He, his, that's not his job, right? His job is just to win. <laughs> so, but, but uh, you know, cognitive psychologists make the point, like Dan Sperber makes the point that our, our, our ability to reason probably evolved not for veridical perception, to know the way the world really is. Uh, it's to win arguments in a social group. It's to show that we're right. Now, I, I'm a little conflicted about this because you have to have some grasp of reality to survive. You know, yes. the, the rustle in the grass is either a dangerous predator or it's just the wind. So if you're going to make one kind of error, uh, make the one that assumes it is a predator just in case, that kind of thing. But, but, but there really are predators. They're really there. This is not complete illusion, right? So there has to be some perception of reality. Yes, yeah. No, I would agree with that. And, uh, and of course, rhetoric is separate. And uh, going back to the lawyers, I mean, the, the lawyers in, in, their, in their mind, they probably do the same as a detective and they must have a feel for, um, for what, what the most likely real situation is. But of course, they know their job is to be an advocate. Yeah, so this brings up um, your, your late compatriot, Stephen Hawking, in his book, The Grand Design, he wrote with Leonard Malad now. Len's been on the show several times. You know, they talk about model-dependent realism 
and that 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 the reality really depends on the model you're using and we can't say for sure what reality really is because we're not omniscient we're not deities and so we fumble and stumble our way through and depend on these models what do you think about that well i don't understand what they're saying at all to be honest i i think uh, uh, there are many things we don't understand um and uh, uh, and obviously um if we don't understand the fundamentals then any um deductions from fundamentals are going to be uncertain um but uh, uh i don't think one need deny that there is some fundamental underny uh, underlying reality um but of course the question which uh, um i'm uncertain about is will we ever understand it it's perfectly on the cards that there are deep aspects of physical reality which our brains just can't cope with because uh, our brains haven't changed very much since uh, our ancestors um, uh, roamed the African savanna and had to worry about snakes in the grass and all that. Um, and uh, um, they haven't changed very much. And so it's amazing that we got so far in understanding not just the uh, everyday world, but the uh, micro world of the quantum and at least to some extent the uh, cosmos. Um, but nonetheless, there may be. Uh, some aspects of reality that we're not aware of, or that we never understand. And I think going back to AI, uh, one point that interests me is um, uh, um, whether some version of string theory is correct. And it's possible that it is correct, but the maths of the ten-dimensional geometry and the number of combinatorial options of that geometry may be too great for any human to actually do the calculation. And of course, until we can calculate um, uh, um, what the theory predicts about something we can test, like the mass of the electron or strength of gravity, uh, then we've got no confidence in the theory. So I think it's possibly going to be the case that um, uh, it'll be possible to feed into an AI um, the uh, uh, basic axioms of some complicated geometry. Just as the rules of Go and chess were fed in to the uh, to the Go Zero computer, um, and let it churn away, and if it spews out at the end the right mass for the electron, or other things which are unexplained in the so-called standard model, uh, and it agrees with our observations, uh, then we'll know that there's something in that theory. Um, but of course, we'll never have the sort of aha insight. Uh, which uh, is the most uh, exciting phase in a scientific discovery, where you, you realize something's true, and you say it should have been obvious all along. You know, and that's a really exciting thing. And uh, no human will have that insight. They'll just know that the machine spewed out the right answer, and so this theory. Um, so, is, so your a your proposed AI would be something like Leibniz's demon that knows every particle in motion in the universe and can calculate the future. Um. Well, no, I think that's a separate question. I mean, uh, that's indeterminism. I mean, I'm okay. just saying it can do it can do a very complicated calculation um, and ca calculate which is the correct theory. Um, because we, um, mm. uh, and then oh, I see. The, that theory uh, um, may be, uh, may not predict in a de deterministic way uh, the um, uh, properties of all particles. But um, we don't have any theory now uh, which. Um, uh, tells us uh, the dozen or so key numbers in the standard model of particle physics um, for the strength of gravity compared to the microscopic forces, etc. Um, and uh, uh, what we might hope is that a string theory would do would do that, and probably predict lots of other particles, etc. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So it could so get to the point where, oh, yeah. say, the Big Bang theory stands now. Versus when, say, in the 1950s, it was in competition with the steady state theory. And over the course of decades, enough evidence accumulates that the one hypothesis wins out over the other one. And we are reasonably confident in a Bayesian way. It's provisionally true with a small t, you know, pending a, a lots of lots of contradictory evidence. You know, it's like in the theory of evolution, since you mentioned uh, the principle of ecri, e extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. When Darwin published... His theory was the extraordinary claim, right? 
because uh, there was other theories of evolution that failed. So he had to uh, amass a lot of evidence. Well, here we are, um, you know, a hundred over 150 years later, and and you know, so what would it take to falsify the the theory? It can't just be one fossil, like you know, a, a fossil rabbit in the Precambrian, as as Haldane yeah, yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. It would have I mean, to be think, a mass of things to overturn it, right? Yes, yes. No, and uh, I think it, it's one of the great triumphs of uh, uh, of, of science, you know, of, up there with the uh, um, the double helix and plate tectonics, that we can now understand the origin of the universe from uh, when it was a, a microsecond old to the present, in in outline, um, and uh, uh, you know, from the very early stage when the temperature was um, uh, with several GeV, um, uh, formation of helium and deuterium and all that, showing one of the right lines for what it was like when it was a few seconds or a few minutes old, um, up to the uh, microwave background where the photons have come from 3, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And I think it's a great triumph that if you put those fluctuations, which tell us about what the universe was like when it was 300,000 years old in a in a computer and run it forward, putting in laws of gravity and gas dynamics, you end up with the universe structured like the universe is now. So we have connections um, from the very early universe um, to the present, and that's great. But of course, every advance brings into focus a new set of questions which we couldn't have posed beforehand. And of course, what we don't know is why is the universe expanding the way it is? Um, why does it contain the particular mix of uh, um, atoms, dark matter, and some kind of vacuum energy? We don't know what it is. Um, we don't, and um, I think we all suspect that the answer to that lies deep within the first microsecond. But the trouble is that in that very, very early phase, um, we are losing our foothold with experiment because um, the particles will have more energy, each of them, than we can produce in the accelerator. So we don't really know the physics in a way that we do know the physics when helium was made, when the universe was a few minutes old. Uh, and so um, the very early universe is more conjectural. We have good theories. Well, the inflation theory is the, the best known. Um, and uh, uh, we can narrow, narrow down the range of options. But uh, I think we're going to have to await a big breakthrough in physics and some theory that links together gravity and the micro world in a firmer way than any theory now does before we can actually um, uh, understand um, the details of why the universe is expanding the way it is. Uh, so science is going to be um, continuing progress uh, of, of um, answering some questions, but then other ones come into focus when you try and answer those. Um, but the question is whether the progress will slow up um, or continue. We don't, we don't know. There's been no really fundamental change in cosmology for the last 25 years. Mm. And, uh, Interesting. Course, okay, let's see how far down right? we can drill to, to hit, hit, hit the epistemological bedrock. So, and I'll, 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 I'll get into it this way. I read your book, Just Six Numbers, when I was writing about the intelligent design creationists, or theorists as they call themselves, because of course, as you know, those six numbers that you write about, the, the kind of the they, it's called the fine tuning of the universe, they say there's no way that could just happen by chance. You know, an intel a, a design element looks like there's a designer. I mean, a fine tuned universe has a must have a fine tuner, or at the very least, it's the inference to the best explanation, as they put it. Yes. What is your explanation for the fine tuning and your just six numbers? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I think one shouldn't exaggerate the degree of fine tuning. Um, there are one or two uh, surprising coincidences. Um, but for instance, um, uh, um, the strength of gravity is not pinned down. It could vary by a, at least 100 either, either way and still have a habitable universe. Um, and, and, uh, and similarly, some of the cosmological numbers, the uh, um, size of fluctuations, etc. So there's, not, there's no very fine tuning. Um, but the, uh, but of course, um, as you know, um, the uh, easy way out is to invoke a multiverse and say that, um, as some string theories predict, um, there are many different vacuum states, um, and uh, each vacuum is the arena for a different kind of physics. So 
um, if there were many big bangs, as in uh, a specific theory like Andre Linde's eternal inflation, um, then um, those universes would cool down differently, um, governed by different microphysics. And then, of course, um, we would be in one of those um, which uh, allowed complex microphysics. I mean, for instance, um, I think one thing we do need is something like a periodic table. It, um, I wrote a paper about what I call the nuclear free universe. This is a universe where um, there are no strong interactions, so you just have hydrogen um, and, uh, and no, no periodic table. And um, it turns out that at large scale, this universe needn't look very different from ours. Stars would exist, galaxies would exist, um, and uh, um, there'd be no nuclear power, so they would just contract down to white dwarfs or black holes. Um, and uh, the way I put it is that this hypothetical universe um, resembles the real universe in the same way that a marble statue resembles a real human being. Uh, looked at in gross properties, it would be the same, but uh, there'd be no kind of complexity if you didn't have a periodic table. Except maybe Fred Hoyle's Black Cloud, if you've read that book, which could be uh, something complicated made of uh, uh, magnetized hydrogen. Um, so that's the example. So I, I think um, um, clearly we can easily imagine universes in which no complexity could evolve. You certainly need to have some big numbers so that the time the universe lasts is very long compared to the time scale for microscopic reactions. But uh, um, there are only one or two tunings where it's actually really fine tuning. Interesting. Then how do you respond to the the argument that the multiverse is just your fate? You don't know that there's multiple universes any more than I know that there's a God. So my postulating that there's a God behind it all is no different than your postulating that there's a multiverse. It's just a word you're using, a linguistic placeholder to fill in the lack of knowledge. Well, I mean, it, it, that could be true now, but the whole point of what I was saying earlier is that uh, um, if we have a theory which applies at the extreme conditions where inflation occurs, that will tell us whether Linde's assumptions are correct. Linde uh, made particular assumptions about the, uh, uh, about the, the so-called potential um, in, in order to, to get his model where you get lots of big bangs. And so if we had a theory um, which... Um, fulfilled the requirements which Linde uh, needs. And if that theory was tested in a low energy world, so again, credibility, then um, we would um, uh, have reason to take seriously um, the, the other big bangs. To give an example, um, we um, can't observe inside black holes, but we believe in what Einstein's theory predicts about the inside of black holes with reasonable confidence, because we've tested Einstein's theory in lots of places where we can make observations. So if you've got a corroboration of the theory, then you take seriously what it predicts even when you can't make observations. And if we had a, um, a string theory that was validated by observations, then um, uh, the idea of the multiverse um, would, would then be in the same um, epistemological state um, as uh, talking about the inside of a black hole now. We have we could be completely sure, but it would be a, a prediction from a theory which has been that battle tested in our low energy world. So, so th th that's why, um, although it is now speculative because we don't ha have any firm physical um, understanding of this tiny, tiny fraction of a second where all the action was, we may well have that, and then um, uh, the um, idea of the multiverse, whether it's true or false, will be no more speculative than. Uh, uh, many other branches of physics are. And we don't know how it's going to turn out. So I think it, we've got to be open-minded about it. Yeah. So it does come down to testability or not. The, the yes. theist or creationist doesn't offer yes. us a testable hypothesis, whereas what everything you said is, in at least in principle, it's testable. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the uh, I, I never really argue with creationists, but... Uh, um, they, they just don't like the uncertainty. They say, uh, we have the answers, you don't. One well, up to us, but that's not mm. the right way. To... Mm. Mm. But that's true in many ways, in many areas of human cognition, where most people are not comfortable with just saying, I don't know. 
like the whole UAP UFO thing, right? I mean, uh, I engage with these people all the time. They they say they admit ninety five percent of them are fully explainable by natural atmospheric phenomenon or weather balloons or drones or spy planes or whatever. But they take that five percent and reconstruct an entire new worldview. Why not just say I don't know what it is? No theory explains everything. There's always yes. anomalies in every science. It, yes, but yes. but most people are not comfortable saying you know I just don't know. No, it's the craving, craving for certainty. They want to have an answer, and of course, they've they've got flip answers to all these difficult problems. And uh, uh, you know what, what I what I would say to to, to them uh, is that m- most of us who study physics know that um, even a hydrogen atom is pretty hard for most of our students to understand. You know, it's quite complicated, uh, and therefore we should not expect to have a full understanding of any more complex aspect aspect of reality. So. Uh, most things um, um, are still mysterious. And incidentally, um, uh, the cosmos and the micro world are probably not the most difficult things because uh, um, in terms of complexity, um, even the smallest insect uh, is more intricate in its structure than an atom or a star. And so the uh, places where the mysteries may survive longest are in the biological world. Neither very small nor very large, but very complicated, and of course the human brain most complicated of all. And so uh, uh, um, I think those are going to be the kind of things where humans uh, may never understand themselves, as it were. But of course, uh, to digress again, right. uh, the, the the one thing which uh, um, astronomers uh, uh, feel perhaps more intensely than most educated people. Um, is that the future is at least as long as the past. I mean, I think um, most people who are quite happy with Darwin and uh, and all that, um, and four billion years of evolution from the first life, um, they, uh, in many cases, somehow feel that um, we are the culmination. We're the top of the tree. I don't think any astronomer can believe that because we know that the uh, sun is less than halfway through its life um, and uh, uh, the universe may go on far longer than that still, even forever. And I like to quote Woody Allen, who said, eternity is very long, especially toward the end. <laughs> yes. But be it as it may, <laughs> toward the end. Then, uh, we, we, uh, um, we shouldn't think of ourselves as more than a halfway stage in the emergence of progressively more complexity. And of course, uh, it's, I've written about this in my, my book, um, what would happen uh, in the, a post-human era Will it be um, um, modified humans um, redesigned, or at what stage um, will we um, uh, convert into uh, purely electronic entities? We don't know, um, but I think we can say for sure that uh, if um, uh, um, we were to come back in six billion years, um, then humans wouldn't exist, but there will be entities as different from us as we are from slime mold, um, maybe not on a planet, but in intergalactic space. Um, and, um, and incidentally, um, I'm an enthusiast for SETI pro- programs, but uh, um, if we ask what SETI likely to see, it's not evidence for a flesh and blood civilization like ours. It's far more likely to be evidence for some um, electronic artifact, which is um, um, a mm-hmm. descendant of uh, uh, what I like to call second intelligent design, which means a uh, um, designed by a succession of uh, <laughs> other more complicated robots. Uh, and so that's what like we should that. look for. <laughs> and incidentally, um, this, I think, eases yeah. the uh, Fermi paradox because um, Darwinian evolution favors um, uh, aggression as well as intelligence. But uh, but but post-human, um, what I call secular intelligent design, may favor intelligence, but not necessarily aggression. So the most intelligent entities in the universe could be... Um, Massive electronic brains just sitting and thinking deep thoughts, and not making themselves visible. Um, and uh, and of course, whereas a civilization like ours may only last a few thousand years, um, then uh, those entities could be near immortal. And so the chances of us finding um, that sort of evidence for another civilization is much higher than catching another civilization when it's in this uh, fairly brief phase of a few thousand years, um, which is. Uh, just one million mm-hmm. lifetime of the system. 
Yeah, I belong to this group at Harvard called the Galileo Project. Uh, you know Avi Loeb uh, as your colleague. He runs that, and you know he's very interested in extraterrestrial artifacts. He agrees with you that if we're going to encounter uh, aliens, they're going to be some artifact, a, a probe or something like this, <laughs> finding the Voyager spacecraft, the equivalent of that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a long shot, but, um, yeah. it, no, no, you know, I, think, I, th I think that's probably look, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah, we should look for everything. We have no idea what, um, what's out there. And, um, um, obviously we should look by astronomical techniques in the radio and the optical as has been done for some time, but, uh, we should keep our eyes open and, uh, look for something specially shiny in the asteroid belt, as it were. And incidentally, this, uh, uh, brings up the question of it's called uh, METI about whether we should um, make ourselves visible and uh, um, you yeah know, yeah it, what do you think about that I find it hard keep to our take mouth shut <laughs> well, uh, I find it hard to take this seriously because in any sort of aliens out there like us they would they would know we we're here for years but on the other hand I think um, if we found something that looked uh, uh, an artifact from another world in our solar system. I think we should be a bit cautious before we go up to it and poke it. So in, in that context, I think uh, uh, the METI argument that we should um, be careful what we do would make some sense. I don't know what your group thinks yeah, about Yeah, so that brings that. up the question of what, it, it, if we encountered a, an advanced extraterrestrial intelligence, they're not going to be just five or ten years ahead of us or a hundred years ahead of us. You know, well, the right. chances of finding them are so slim, they're, they're either going to be way behind us or a million yes. years ahead of us. Yes, that's right. And so, you know, this brings up the subject of, you know, uh, uh, what I what I call Shermer's last law, because I don't name laws after myself, but and this wasn't my original idea anyway. Any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence would be indistinguishable from God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Arthur C. Clarke said magic, didn't he? Yes, yes, mm. yes. Right. Um, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Same principle. Yes. No, 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 right. So, I mean, good. it's like if you showed a if you showed a, a smartphone to a Neanderthal, you know, you 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 would be like a deity to the Neanderthal. But it's just technology. You know. So it seems to me, even by the go back to the creationists and the theists that are looking for intelligent design, you know, a super advanced extraterrestrial intelligence capable of genetically engineering life forms maybe super engineering planetary systems causing stars to collapse into black holes and create new universes. You know, these are all sci-fi, of course, but, but, but technically possible, you know, given maybe 10 million years of evolution technologically, whatever it would be, uh, which is plenty possible in our time frame of the universe's age. So if you encountered a, a an entity able to engineer entire solar systems, stars, universes, life forms, that's God. Yes, yeah, so that's a semantic point. <laughs> yeah, it is a semantic point. But that's kind of what it comes down to, doesn't it, right? Um, I mean, uh, you're not a religious man, I trust, but, um, you know, at some point we just hit the wall of we just can't know. I mean, the, the, the theist is always going to ask you, okay, Dr. Reese, what gave what caused the bang, big bang to bang and what was there before the big bang and if you say well there was nothing and or if you say oh quantum foam fluctuation you know phrase that hawking used well, well where I did the quantum say, foam come from yes yes well i would say we, we don't know we, we don't know but uh they don't know either <laughs> right right and uh, one shouldn't expect in your worldview well, yes, of course, yes. But in your worldview, is there room for religious beliefs, how, however you want to conceive of it? Um, well, um, or 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 yes. how do you think about that? Well, there's certainly room for religious practice, um, and uh, um, I, I don't mm. believe in religious dogma, but I do um, I do support our church, um, and uh, I want to be buried in a church, in a churchyard, and uh, not by the military ceremony. Um, and I think most people like some kind of ceremonial. <laughs> and uh, and also, um, religion brings people together when so much divides us. And it um, it also um, uh, um, makes us aware of what we owe to past generations, etc. So when so much divides us and is short term, I think it helps. Um, and so in that spirit, um, I go to the um, religion I was brought up 
with, which was a Protestant church. If I was um, born in Iran, I would go to the mosque in the same spirit. Um, because I think what's important is I don't believe in any religious dogma at all, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, I think that um, uh, the important thing about religion is that it's something that brings people together and emphasizes what they have in, in common. So um, I, I'm not um, like Dawkins who wants to extinguish religion and attack it. To give a particular example where I disagree with him, um, <clears throat> if, um, if, if I was teaching a class um, um, of, um, which had some Muslims in it and Christians, um, and, um, and they asked about religion, um, if I told them they couldn't have their God and science, then they'd stick with their God and be lost to science. And so I think one could say that, uh, as, as we know very well, there are many um, scientists um, who are religious, at least in the sense in which, which I am, and uh, some actually believe the stuff. Um, but I, I think we, I can't understand how they actually believe in specific dogma. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, I wouldn't want to do anything to um, uh, uh, erode their beliefs. So I am mm. uh, against aggressive atheists. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So this would be something like Einstein's uh, invocation of Spinoza's God, just the laws of nature, uh, the reverence for that, and the cultural aspects of religion, in his case, would, Judaism. But, but I think, uh, yes, but, but uh, I just uh, um, think that um, uh, religious rituals, um, um, you know, to mark mm. births and deaths and all that, um, um, are things which should be celebrated and uh, leaving flowers on graves and all that is something which uh, um, most people want to do and it shouldn't be discouraged um, and uh, it emphasizes what we have in common and we value all, all human lives and um, uh, these customs have uh, grown up over the centuries so they make us aware of what we owe to past generations and certainly in, mm. uh, in my country they are um, uh, attached to wonderful accretions of aesthetics and music and architecture and all that, um, which is inspiring. And so um, I think um, to participate in, in those rituals now and again um, is something which I wouldn't want to discourage. Mm. Of course, there are secular groups like that, want, secular humanists and that. ethical mm. humanists. That, yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, there's a, a position in philosophy called fideism, F-I-D-E-I-S-M. It's a William James's kind of pragmatic theory of truth that yes, yes. If, if it's really important, it changes your life and it can't be proved one way or the other, then it's okay to make a leap of faith and just say, I believe it. So free will is one of those examples. You know, we live in a determined universe, but I feel like I make free choices. It, it makes my life much better. Uh, we makes a civilized society better to assume people have free choices and we hold them morally accountable and so on. Uh, I can't really prove it, but you can't prove it otherwise. It's a big debate. So just pick whatever side you want that works for you. And, and this Fidia's position applies that to God, you know, just whatever you conceive of it as I'm not going to get specific. Martin Gardner was one of the founders of the modern skeptical movement. And he was a fideist. He said, I believe in God, you know, and, and, and so forth, but I can't prove it. I think the atheists have slightly better arguments than the theists, but, you know, it's, this is what works for me, and that's it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, I, th I think that's, that's true. And, um, uh, you know, uh, um, I can't prove that um, you or even my family aren't all zombies. Um, but but uh, uh, it's... Um, <laughs> right. It makes me have a happier life if I believe that they really are like me, and they and they are conscious, and and the relations with them are what they seem to be. Uh, although obviously, um, one one can't uh, can't actually prove that anyone else isn't a zombie. Um, and uh, to take a, a simple example, um, um, I I believe my dog is pleased to see me every morning, <laughs> but of course uh, <laughs> uh, that, that that may 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 not be true in any deep sense. Um, but um, uh, I'm happy to believe it. Yeah, exactly. So it's um, th there's kind of a, a pragmatic theory of truth in that sense. And in any case, we may never know. So this gets me to really my last question of this idea of unknown unknowns that 
or, or these kind of Mysterian mysteries, mysteries we can't even in principle solve because our brains are just not big enough. I mean, if we had a brain the size of the earth or whatever, you know, maybe we'd solve these problems or maybe it's the structure of our neural networks. We can only conceive of things a certain way. And, you know, we just, there just may be things we can't know. How, how do you think about those ultimate questions? Uh, well, as I said earlier, I, I, I take that possibility seriously that uh, there may be deep aspects of reality which are beyond what we can uh, uh, comprehend. Um, or indeed, a, although it's a separate issue, there could be a um, phenomena that uh, um, our senses aren't aware of. Natural phenomena, that's another possibility. Um, but I think um, uh, the key question is whether um, uh, any brains more powerful than ours will evolve and to what extent um, flesh and blood brains can uh, get much bigger and more powerful um, as compared to electronic brains and um, are things like consciousness specific to the particular um, substratum that the brain is made of or not? These are unknown questions. We don't know. Um, and um, they, they may be questions that we can never know. But I think you know, there's no reason to believe that we've got to the terminus yet. We've got a long way to go, but still, but still, as as we've seen in um, as, as astronomy, um, uh, uh, new discoveries um, are opened up all the time as we observe more deeply um, and make the world and the universe more interesting. And uh, we don't know how long that's going to go on. I mean, we've got the James Webb Telescope, which is going to tell us a bit more about how galaxies form, and also perhaps even more exciting, um, perhaps get the first crude observations of Earth-like planets orbiting other stars, uh, which is um, something that's very exciting to all of us. And so I, I think um, we can expect um, uh, exciting exploration of the cosmos by telescopes and robotically. Um, but uh, uh, the more we learn, then uh, the more we realize lies beyond the frontier, I think. Mm-hmm. You ever wish you could be cryonically frozen and brought back to life a thousand years from now to see what, what how all this turns out for 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 our ancestors or our descendants? <laughs> well, no, but in fact, uh, uh, I, I know some people who have. In fact, there are two uh, of my friends from Oxford um, who um, uh, who have paid good money to be uh, frozen by this company in Arizona, um, and they they wear a sort of medallion yeah. around their neck. Alcor. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So they should be uh, grabbed and put in liquid nitrogen as soon as they die. Um, two have done this. I think a third has right. been the cut price option of just having his head frozen. Um, but uh, uh, I <laughs> uh, two, two things yeah. about this. First, um, uh, well, if it ever worked, I think it's selfish because um, you, you're expected to be revived into a world where you're uh, 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 going to be a sort of refugee and, and just troublesome. Um, you know, we, we feel an obligation to uh, um, look after some refugee whose natural habitat or an indigenous person who's lost lost his environment, etc. Um, but th these people would be inflicting themselves voluntarily, as it were, on future generations. And I'm not sure how ethical that is. Um, but of course, it's most unlikely to be true. But uh, um, I haven't paid for this. And uh, I tell these people that... Um, I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than an American refrigerator. <laughs> That's pretty funny. But imagine if 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 uh, instead of Newton dying the way he did, he fell into a a frozen glacier and in and we managed to dethaw him and bring him back to life now. I mean, he how shocked would he be about just physics and cosmology and astronomy? Well, I, I think I think very shocked. I mean, um, um, he'd understand some things. I mean, he'd understand planets around stars. They're saying the stars are like the sun, etc. Um, but I think um, um, they, they would be amazed and, uh, and of course, amazed that we understood so much because until the mid-19th century, it was widely thought that the stars were made of some special fifth essence, not the earth, air, fire, and water that the Earth was made of, and so um, the idea that we will um, understand the stars and how they form and how they evolve um, would have surprised people 
before 1850 anyway. Interesting. And black holes. All right, Martin, this has been a great conversation. Oh, yeah, 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 right. (laughs) Well, this has been fascinating. I think the last time I saw you was at the TED conference. We were both the, like, TED All-Stars or something like that. (laughs) That was pretty funny. Uh, I think you were talking about your... The, the 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 concerns about existential threats and, and that sort of thing. Well, let's hope uh, that your optimism about science saving us uh, uh, works out well. Yes. So here's the book. Yeah. There it is. But yes. Thank you, Michael, for your time. <laughs> it's been yeah. Dutch. All right. Thank you. No, thank you for your time.